Whereas if you look at um, a problem and say, hey, this calls for a very different approach and maybe uh, really this is such an ambiguous and weird problem that what I should do is pick up a poetry book uh, from the 17th century and read a few poems and then um, go maybe try to write a poem and uh, do a little painting to understand my uh, mental model of this uh, situation, that can often be a huge and much uh, a bigger breakthrough Today, I'm talking to Venkatesh Rao, indie consultant and writer, just released a two-part series, The Art of Gig, which was based on a newsletter series he published on Substack a couple of years ago. I just reread the books. Uh, They're awesome. They bring alive a lot of indie and freelance experiences. Literally made me laugh out loud several times because I resonated so much with some of the experiences. Um... Also writes on Ribbon Farm for several years about emerging tech and the internet and is experimenting with what the future of indie work looks like with Yak Collective. Welcome to the podcast, Venkatesh. Pleasure to be here, Paul. Wanted to start with a quote which sort of aligns with a question I kick off with with many people, which is what are the scripts and stories you grew up with around work? You said this in the book, did I really leave the paycheck world I was factory manufactured to inhabit and learn a whole new set of work ways, ways new to humanity over the course of the last 10 years? Uh, So it seems like this book was a way to sort of reflect on that journey. Um, Seems like it's kind of crazy looking back. Why did you uh, leave the world you were factory manufactured to inhabit. Yeah, it's uh, it surprised me because I don't think of myself as a uh, uh, kind of like um, rebellious chip on the shoulder personality that's always chafing against uh, scripts or uh, you know particularly hostile to these scripts my parents lived out. So my dad was. Uh, a classic organization man. He worked for Tata Steel all his life. And then towards the end of his career, he spent a few years uh, running a smaller company. And then he retired to like a traditional retirement. And that seemed like a pretty good plan to me. Like there was nothing about that plan that struck me as like, um, uh, I don't know, awful and unbearable. And uh, the factory manufactured part, um, I guess I'm referring to school and college as... um, the factory. And I think that's a common metaphor. But again, I was not one of the kids that hated school or particularly chafed against the controls. I was not a riddle in. I'm not particularly ADHD, (laughs) unable to sit still and listen and do homework. So I was a good student. And uh, I not only did I do well in school, I actually enjoyed my schooling. It was like fun. I liked studying. Uh, And I ended up, um, as you might expect, getting like um, three degrees. So I clearly must have enjoyed it enough to like stay in school all the way through a PhD, right? Uh, And I enjoyed my job too. Like, again, I don't have the usual reasons for quitting, which is like hating your job. I was like appreciated and enjoying my work at Xerox uh, 2006 to 2011. So not only was I factory manufactured for this world, I actually enjoyed being in that world as well. Uh, And I think uh, when I reflect back, what made me quit it is, it's one of those things, uh, it's like uh, Nassim Taleb's Turkey example. It's like 99% of the days are great. You're enjoying yourself and uh, sort of uh, you fit the script and the world and the context and the environment and it's fun. But when it breaks, it breaks really badly. So the crisis moments uh, in the factory manufactured world and path they are really bad. And I had a couple of like crisis moments. One was uh, breaking up with my first PhD advisor. That's also part of the factory world. And then I quit and went off to work for a startup for a year. This was in 2000 and came back to a different advisor. So my processing of that crisis of, um, you know, relationship with my PhD advisor was one. And that Xerox, uh, I guess enough time has passed that I can uh, talk about it. Yeah. I enjoyed my projects. I had good executive support. But at some point I had like, an irreconcilable run-in with uh, corporate marketing. They wanted to market my projects a certain way. I did not want them marketed that way. And push come to shove, the CMO basically outranked me. And it was like, 
it's, this is not a crisis I can fall sticking around and it's basically not an option to stick around. So, and then the option to just go off into the gig economy, um, while the blog that was ribbon farm was there. So I just took it and it worked. So, uh, that's kind of what I mean by, yeah, factory manufactured and then ex exiting because it was surprising to me that I ended up here. Yeah, it, it seems especially like as the years go on, more people are more aware of it. So I see more people more intent intentionally going into it. And I sense like your book will be part of a more intentional movement as well. What were some of the models you had in your head about this world? Like, had you read Dan Pink's book before taking the leap? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, I uh, read and reviewed uh, several of Dan Pink's books uh, early on in my blog. If you go like 2007 to nine, there, there might be a couple of reviews, Free Agent Nation and others. Uh, and I actually met uh, Dan um, once at a book reading and I got to know him a little bit personally. Uh, but yeah, the, I actually studied this quite deeply. Like at Xerox, one of my projects was Future of Work because... If you remember, between like 1999 to around 2009, the middle of the recession, um, the future of work was like always in the top three of like trend topics. Everybody talked about it, all constant and things, right? And Xerox had a project, I was leading it. We even built a, a marketplace type product to like manage freelance labor and Xerox. So like, you know, graphic designers and stuff. I was leading that project. So studying the future of work theoretically from the comfort of a paycheck position for several years before I made the leap myself. And looking back, that was a little bit of a luxury because I got to like read, uh, you know, Dan Pink. And then uh, uh, I actually collaborated with the old desk people uh, in what became Upwork a few years later. So I got to study it in comfort. And when I made the leap, I was like possibly over prepared for like unrelated reasons. Yeah, that's. That's a point you make in the book, which is uh, maybe it's better not to know what you're getting into, and especially the the inner game side of it. Um, so maybe break down like we have like you frame it as like the outer game and the inner game. The outer game is like all right, get your taxes right, get your LLC set up, but the inner game is like knowing what to expect in terms of like how bad you might actually feel. Um, maybe say yeah. a bit more about uh, prepping or not prepping. Yeah, this is, uh, I go back and forth because it's, of course, hard to break out of the context of your own journey. And I'm sure you have the same experience. It's like, yeah. you get excited about reflecting back, learning all the lessons and think, hey, I could convey this and ask people who come after me might have an easier time or at least make more interesting, newer mistakes than I did, right? Uh, so uh, I think it, it comes down a little bit to temperament and personalities. There are people who like to like overprepare and like see what came before. Uh, you know, what Balaji called the idea maze. You want to like learn the idea maze that has come before. But then there are also people who kind of want to like roll the dice and like go in with a fresh mind. And the upside there is you might discover like really novel and interesting new patterns instead of getting trapped in the you know idea mazes of people who came before. So there's it's kind of like a risk trade-off. And depending on your temperament, I would suggest, um, I don't know, trying a little bit of um, both paths and seeing what fits. Uh, but I think on balance, I am not that creative or imaginative personally. And I benefited from learning about what had come before, uh, like, you know, Dan Pink and others. Uh, so uh, that's the path I think I'm uh, more comfortable with. But the inner game part, that's that's kind of interesting. I think there's two things there. One is if you know too much about the risk and how hard it's going to be, you might get scared off on, like, day minus 10, right? Uh, and I think a good article about this, which I, I don't think I mentioned this in any of the book essays, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's called How Erotic Kid Ruined the World. And uh, it's, it's an article, uh, I forget the author's name. Uh, I think it's on Cracked. Uh, but the article talks about this notion of effort shock, which is movies like The Karate Kid take a very difficult journey and compress the hardest part down into like a training montage. And therefore you walk in thinking it's going to be easy. And by the time you figure out that it's really, really hard, <laughs> you don't know anybody and you've already done most of the work and it's sunk cost and you power through and do it, right? So that's one side of it. So I think in this case, the effort shock is actually not that bad. A lot of the difficulties in your head. Uh, but the other side of the inner game is uh, this principle from storytelling that 
uh, when you're writing like a fictional story, you possibly don't want to work out the whole plot ahead of time because if you figure out the ending yourself, you're going to be too bored to write the story. Like uh, to take a simple example from murder mystery, uh, murders are like uh, kind of interesting because you do have to like logically plot out the puzzle with the twists and turns and you kind of have to know who the murderer is before you start writing the story, right? Uh, but you don't want to know too much, like the motivations and the surprises and the twists and turns and things like that, because otherwise your writing will kind of bore you and it'll show. Even if you power through and finish the writing, it'll show uh, that you were bored while writing it. Uh, so I think that's another reason to basically not overprepare or learn too much. So I don't know about how to like balance these two things. Maybe the trick is to sample and learn like if uh, anybody reads my books maybe the thing to do is like uh, read the chapters since they're pretty stand standalone read the chapters that sort of seem interesting and intriguing to read but skip the ones you kind of don't want to know about like maybe you don't want to know about the message of managing personal finances and want to find out the hard way so i i think you want to like pick your battles though you want to you don't want to like leave too many like time bombs that littered around the landscape you're uh, wandering to yeah, do you think I mean, do you think indie consulting just on on the margin attracts kind of people that sort of just want to find out how the story goes? Like in the career world more than ever, I sense like you can at least map a story of how your life is supposed to go in your head and you can like sort of match up to that. And I I talk to people especially in tech like they've solved their money problem. And then they'll talk to me and be like, well, um, don't you worry about like not making a predictable income? And it, it's literally impossible to convey to them that like, well, there there is some like, <laughs> it's kind of fun to like put your life on the edge a little bit. And then like that you realize over time, the longer you're on this path, like going a couple months without an income might actually end up in somewhere more interesting. Yeah. And I think um, there's almost a false sense of security about the predictability of paycheck life anyway. Like, uh, yeah. you know, some like, I don't know, ceremonial formal thing. Like I know if I had stayed at Xerox, uh, I was a, a senior researcher there and the next step up the ladder was uh, something called area manager. Then I would either be a program manager or a lab manager. And if my career went on, I would be a center manager. And that's the track that leads to CTO of Xerox, right? Uh, so the formal structure of the path is visible but who the hell knows what layoffs are coming what ups and downs the company is going to go through like xerox has been through a couple of existential crises since i left just in a decade and i don't know if i would have survived that or whatever i was up to would have survived so there's the false sense of security part and i think actually uh, the uh, the predictability and assurance of a free agent life uh, once you've kind of like uh, found your footing is much higher because the short-term uncertainty is higher. But long-term, since you get into the habit of maintaining a portfolio of clients, a couple of like uh, non-consulting uh, things going on like book publishing or like a sub stack or whatever, y your uh, short-term volatility actually buys you kind of long-term insurance from like, like, you know, all the people going through layoffs right now in the tech industry. That's like, for people who've always been in like paycheck careers, it's a kind of shock they've never dealt with. Whereas for me, I have a couple of big gigs, a couple of smaller gigs, a sub stack and so forth. And if I lose any one of them, I'll make a couple of little adjustments, but fundamentally it's not going to kill me. And yes, there are correlations. It's not a completely uncorrelated portfolio. It could be like, there'll be like a black swan events that wipes out all the things in the portfolio at once. But I think fundamentally it's a, it's a safer path. And to your point about uh, it's actually fun to not know some things. I think, um, personally, I have like areas where I like to not know. For example, I like to not know the context of what I'll be working on. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> one gig to the next, whether I'm going to be working on like semiconductor stuff or, uh, you know, climate technology or uh, energy transitions or, you know, big software or cloud company, whatever. It's kind of fun not to know. Whereas if you're in a single company or even a single sector, you kind of know what the big challenges of the sector are, uh, how you're going to like uh, work on them through different uh, stints in different companies. So I like not knowing as, a, as much about the content. Like every year, 
is at least one interesting new surprising gig where I learn fun things. Uh, but I do like knowing uh, something equivalent to like, you know, having a sense of the career progression of like, all right, I'm going to like level up in this particular way roughly. And I think uh, I tried to get at that in one of the essays. I think I called it like leverage curves or something like that, where there is something that's kind of equivalent to a career path in a traditional career where you get the equivalent of promotion. Like, uh, for example, if you've done like just gig after gig of consulting for a while, maybe you want to start writing. Maybe if you've done writing and gig work for a while, maybe you want to like create an online course. And these things can be sort of structured to provide like a, a personally created promotions ladder, so to speak. And it's not that you want to like have like give yourself silly titles like I'm now VP instead of manager. It's that you want a sense of like narrative progress, uh, progression in your life, but it feels like there are chapters and ends to chapters and interesting new chapters. Yeah. Do you, do you sense that, um, do you have like a reserve of like ideas, like breaking case of emergency of like, I sort of have this idea, idea of like, okay, I can do like sort of like big consulting type projects. I could probably plug into one of those projects, but that's kind of like the break in case of emergency. Um, and that kind of gives me the comfort to then like do the other stuff. But the whole point of like my freelance work is to never do that stuff and sort of like to create, to create my own path. Do you have similar things or do you sort of have the inner confidence now that what you're doing on the freelance side, you could probably sustain for at least the next five, 10 years? Uh, no, I definitely don't have the confidence, but I do have uh, more money though. So my saving situation and like just sheer cash liquidity has improved. Like when I first quit in 2011, it was uh, kind of tough to create like a six month uh, runway of savings. And then my wife quit her job around the same time. Uh, and so for a while there, things were dicey. And then for the first few years, it was hard to maintain the cash runway. And then it's become easier due to various reasons. So that's one thing. So I can't claim uh, any increase in like, you know, courage or uh, like raw confidence, though the raw confidence has also increased. I mean, I'm better known now. I'm kind of like, uh, I have my email uh, lists and stuff. So I do have like uh, ways to like uh, start or try new things in extremely leveraged ways. Like any idea I get on making money, no matter how dumb, I have a 12,000 person email list I can blast it out to and sink or swim, I, I have like that steroid that it can work with. But for the first few years um, before my savings situation uh, improved, I think I was relying on... Uh, the idea that I can easily do courses. So I've done like a couple of online courses, but that's like a very quick inorganic ramp up in revenue. I, I've done one writing course. I turned my breaking smart essays into another course. And I think I have like five or six teams in my writing where I could like, you know, pull like a dozen articles, create a couple of slide decks around them and like launch a course in relatively short order. And that would like probably be enough to patch over like, you know, short term cash flow crunches. Uh, but I have to say, ever since Substack uh, became like a good option, that's changed. That has now become my backup. It's become my stabilizing revenue stream. And it's significant enough now um, that it's uh, not just the backup. It's actually a live cash flow that's uh, less volatile. So uh, to a certain extent, I'm like not thinking that much about things like courses anymore because, uh, well, I do like teaching and courses a little bit, but uh, not enough that I appreciate the thought of being forced into it uh, under the gun to make money. Like if I do a course, I want to like get into it because I want to and I enjoy the material. Uh, so that's kind of my backup plan. Uh, your backup plan of like uh, getting into the big consulting gigs, I think that works for you because you came from the big consulting world, which I have never worked in. So I would not have the first clue about how to go around uh, uh, plugging myself into that kind of project. I have friends in that world like yourself, but I wouldn't actually know how to do it. So that's not my plan B at all. Yeah, I think it, that is like an extreme plan now. I definitely <laughs> don't want to go back and work at the firms. I could plug into one of these projects for three months maybe. They're like PMO projects. They're like, you don't want to be doing these projects. <laughs> this would make you quit consulting forever. But um <laughs> Uh, it, it there is a certain amount of confidence you can get by just like 
even if you're like not even launching a course, just like building something and making like a hundred bucks from it, it's like, oh, this is a possible um, way to make money. Yep. Um, is that sort of how you've thought about things too, in terms of just experimenting online? Uh, I think to a much lesser extent than most people think that way. And I think that's mostly a function of my age. Because remember, I did a PhD and a postdoc. So my first yeah. real job was at age, uh, what was it, uh, 32. And most people who kind of like start dabbling like this do start doing so like in their early 20s. So when you're like um, 32, 33 and married and used to like uh, <coughs> a decent paycheck lifestyle, uh a hundred dollars is not enough to build confidence. And I had that. Like I started my blog in 2007 and I quit in 2011. And I got my first Google AdSense checks for like, you know, a hundred bucks in like 2008 or something. I got, I, by 2011, I was getting Amazon affiliate income that was like several hundred bucks worth. Uh, I was writing a few guest posts at a couple of other um, industry blogs for like 200 bucks a pop. It was fun and it was kind of like minor validation, but I wouldn't say it inspired a great deal of um, confidence in my path. I would say if I had to put a number on it, for me, confidence building cannot start until it's like um, $1,000 a month uh, level cash flow. So if I could look at it and very trivially, you know, flip a switch, turn a knob and start bringing in $1,000 a month, then I'll take it seriously as a confidence builder. 100, 200, maybe the inflation talking, it's pocket change. It's not enough to <laughs> take serious risks on. Pre, pre-pandemic, maybe. <laughs> um, you you have a really good understanding of the big consulting firms. Um, probably better than like most of my former colleagues. <laughs> um, <laughs> why, why do you think understanding big consulting big consulting is so important for indies, which I, I think you're spot on on this. So, uh, and I, I mean, uh, you have to give the devil their due. They pioneered this whole thing, right? Uh, I really love this uh, book, Lords of Strategy, which I cite like a couple of points in the book uh, by Walter Kijel. Uh, and uh, he, he talks about the history of how strategy consulting in particular came out of like the uh, 1970s Japanese competition, oil shots era, and companies have to get out from being like uh, dull, unimaginative, just uh, plow along in a straight line type of like uh, old school managed companies to companies that actually think strategically and steer. And yeah, I think um, BCG, Bain, uh, McKinsey, um, Howard Business School, for about 15, 20 years, they were doing like some serious, real hard thinking and actually injecting some really solid intellectual DNA into kind of a stupid business sector. Like, I, I like to think of like the overall IQ of the business world of uh, going through cycles. Like the business world used to be kind of dumb before the robber baron era. So, and then it had a period of like rapid IQ increase in like 1870s to maybe 1920s. Then after uh, the New Deal and the Roosevelt era in, in the US, it kind of got stupid for a few decades. Uh, you can actually go back when you see the Reagan-Thatcher era start. Um, and this was, I think, uh, I forget where I read it, but in the Thatcher uh, UK, it does seem leaders were, were actually scared of the free market. They were so used to like the protectionist world that many of them complained to Margaret, uh, Margaret Thatcher about like, how are we going to survive, blah, blah, blah. And today we are at the other end of the extreme um, the pendulum, uh, pendulum swing where they're like extremely overconfident about their ability to survive and like do good in the Hobbesian uh, marketplace, right? Uh, so you can think of this as like IQ and confidence sort of like um, cycling uh, through. And I kind of like uh, went off on a, a bunny trail here. But the point is the reason... Uh, big consulting was valuable during its uh, heyday was it really leveled up the IQ of the business world by about, I I would say, 20 to 30 IQ points. Like People were starting to think critically and so forth. Then, of course, it got institutionalized, captured, cronyist, all the problems you and I have talked about, uh, and it's also in um, both our books. Um, I think it's like the end of a cycle, and uh, the business world, I think, is honestly getting stupider again. So it needs a fresh injection of uh, 
intelligence and yeah, we have to plumb new sources of intelligence. But yeah, for a while there, the consulting world was worth learning from. And yeah, I consciously tried to learn from them how they operate. Yeah, one thing that stood out in Lords of Strategy was how BCG, uh, Bruce Henderson is like, let's split our team into competing tribes and we're just going to like see who can create the best firm. <laughs> And it's a crazy experiment. Like no big firm would do this now. And Bill, I think Bill Bain um, was basically like, we came up with a better net model. Now we're taking all the consultants and starting our own firm. Um, and yeah, it's just hard to imagine that kind of um, boldness in today's world. And yeah, I dug into this, the explosion of ideas in the late 60s to the early 80s was just really impressive. Like you probably would have been someone that would have been in that world in that time period. Oh um, yeah. They had a lot Absolutely. of weirdos. <laughs> and also there was no other option for people like us if you think about right. it. It wasn't the internet, there wasn't this option to like just create a random independent thing like if you read um, uh, advice on starting your own small business from the 80s or 90s, like the Emit uh, Michael Gerber's book, you get the sense that this is fundamentally um, mental models from an era where the environment was way more hostile to uh, this kind of path. Uh, uh, but uh, just a point on your um, uh, Bruce Anderson internal competition, uh, I actually thought about that and it strikes me that that kind of like competitive boldness, like create a Darwinian subculture. Uh, it's kind of more common in companies now, but it's always been the preserve of like one level of abstraction higher. Like, you know, government procurement works that way. Like fighter aircraft are usually, uh, you order one prototype from Boeing, one from Lockheed, you call them X and Y, there's a fly off and then the winner uh, gets the big contract, right? Uh, but it's interesting to reflect on what happens to such apparently uh, honest competitions, like DARPA grant challenges are, are similar. They tend to get captured by the competitors. Like uh, what happens is at some point Boeing and Lockheed get big enough that they can basically rig the competition. So even though it looks like an X versus Y fly off, everybody knows that the joint strike fighter contract is going to like unfold a certain way based on like who knows which senators and where the jobs are being built. And I think uh, uh, the DARPA grand challenges are better, but they're also sort of uh, vulnerable to this kind of capture. Uh, so I think actually the best kind of like um, positive Dar Darwinism, so to speak, I don't want to like uh, 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 condone social Darwinism, but the indie consulting sector really is like a healthy kind of like trial, like a uh, thousand people trying out a thousand different experiments and uh, learning from each other. So I like this kind of Darwinism. Yeah, the... An interesting connection here. You point out this divide between like the positioning school and the people school, and these. Uh, I think a big problem with the big consulting firms now is they are just so ingrained in that positioning school of how you put it is basically you're starting with like these models, these frameworks, these uh, big ideas that were really part of the industrial 20th century economy, and then working downstream of like, okay, how can we optimize around those? When I took the leap, I was sort of surprised that like, oh, as an indie consultant, you don't do any of that, <laughs> right? You're, it, it's so different. Um, you're really just, you're an individual person basically just trying to help either one other person or like a small team. Um, and that was a big lesson for me. Um was that something hard for you to learn at the beginning and maybe say a little bit about like the positioning versus people school? Yeah. So the positioning versus people, of course, is also from Walter Kijil's um, book. Um, and he makes the point that, uh, yeah, the people school has always been around, but it, until very recently, it was the minority tradition. Like, you know, University of Toronto has several academics who work in it, uh, Carl Weig, um, a couple of others. Um I think for me, it was always the more natural school because I came from like uh, uh, academic uh, research, uh, lab-like settings where you always work in this sort of uh, small, intimate, uh, relatively unstructured context. Uh, and I think um, the big three consulting world is a positioning school for a reason. One is, of course, path dependency and its initial conditions, uh, 
But the other is the, the way they deliver the work product is you've got the senior engagement managers who are kind of doing the slightly personalized relationships with the senior leaders of the uh, client organization. But then you also have this like massive army of rank and file uh, junior associates going and like doing interviews, collecting data, massaging them into Excel spreadsheets. And then even though, even when uh, firms like McKinsey don't do um, participation and execution, just deploying the advice itself, it breaks down into, yes, you have to like be in the boardroom, maybe advising the board and CEO with the high level presentation, but you also have to like create like the well, operating process where for the middle management to use at scale. Like if you're suggesting a huge restructuring with layoffs here and growth there and so forth, you kind of have to give the middle management ranks a lot of and the operating system uh, <laughs> crudware, honestly, which may or may not work depending on how good the engagement turned out. Uh, with individuals, we can't scale. Like at most, you might subcontract to one or two other people, so you literally can't do this. So you're forced to be much more of a strategy player in a very real organic sense. And I think this goes back to, like, you know, Clausewitz um, and Sun Tzu, which is part of the reason... I titled my books Art of Gig because I kind of like uh, one like gesture of the tradition that comes from like the softer Taoist uh, notion of strategy that uh, then goes through Clausewitz. The reason I'm mentioning Clausewitz is uh, I think that's the origin of the positioning versus uh, people divide because in the time of Napoleon, um, the sort of dominant sort of understanding of like why Napoleon was a great leader, blah, 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 was this guy named... Um, uh, uh, Chomini, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, but uh, Chomini had kind of like a very, what we would today call a, a spreadsheet approach to analyzing strategy. It's like, you know, you are, you're at point A, you want to go to point B, here's the map, get the shortest path from A to B. And of course, that's not how you do strategy because everybody can guess that you might do the shortest path and wait to ambush you on the shortest path. The point of strategy is to like do this thing, it, you know, think how the opponent might think and like get inside their heads, get inside their Buddha loop, maybe go through an unexpected site, slanking maneuver, things like that. And this was what Clausewitz uh, sort of saw as the essence of Napoleon's genius, which Jomini completely missed. Jomini kind of like analyzed Napoleon like he was a spreadsheet guy. Um, Clausewitz saw that the true genius of Napoleon was his ability to like spot these like unusual intuitive strategy paths that nobody else would expect and then would surprise the hell out of the... Uh, uh, opponent. And I think of um, this as kind of like a storytelling uh, soft strategy um, art of gig. And the way it plays out in consulting gigs is you still want to have the same kind of impact. Like, you know, you want the CEO to be influenced. You want the board to steer the company a certain way. You want middle management to start doing things differently. But you don't go hit it on the nose. You ask, what's the subtle thing I can do uh, in terms of suggestions to my senior executive client, plus like maybe a couple of seeds of uh, process scaffolding for the middle managers that allows the whole company to steer with like far less input from me, right? So it's it's trying to have very leveraged impact by actually doing strategy because you have no choice but to do strategy because you're in this asymmetrically weaker gorilla position. You do not have the option of throwing like a dozen junior associates armed with uh, sheets into the organization right so you have to be more strategic yeah i was in i was in like people school functions inside the big firms and we would just force create so much structured frameworks on top of our stuff which is just like that's the stuff that kills you <laughs> oh, do that God. long enough but um I love at the beginning of your book, you have these 42 maximums and you kind of score, okay, if you agree with these or disagree, you should have a strong view. If you don't have any view, you probably um, don't know what's going on. But uh, one of them was no uh, avoid polished deliverables. Uh, so this kind of relates um, and is something I learned pretty quick, which is like, oh, I should just like send work in progress notes and half-baked frameworks to the client and get um, reactions because I don't have an engagement manager anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, I think, is uh, an idea I came to intuitively as well as like um, just temperamentally because I'm honestly lazy. 
And I figured out the logic of why. That could be me too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But I figured out the logic after I saw it working actually better than the, you know, polish deliver both. Like it struck me that working really hard to produce a polished del- or deliverable, if that's what the client wants, it means you're talking to middle managers with no real agency or authority and the PowerPoint or whatever is going to like percolate up to somebody else. And then the, you know, uh, highest paid person's opinion in the room will prevail. And it's like you're playing games at the wrong uh, level. Uh, whereas if you just have like... Um, sparring meetings as I call them and like send quick email notes later which is in my case just bullet lists of points uh, with like links to things we talked about you're actually seriously in their head and they're in your head you're like properly uh, having an entangled conversation and the rationalization and justification and logic of this I've discovered later um, I, I quote this a lot. It's on my um, main web page as well. The Carl White, uh, what theory is not, theorizing is a paper. So it's a classic and it's actually an example of its own theory because it's not actually an an original paper. It's like a comment in response to somebody else's paper. And it's kind of like confusing to read this paper because the preamble is like, we are responding to this other paper by these people who don't know what they're talking about. But the uh, main uh, a point there, uh, and it's on my uh, website, uh, venkateshwara.com, the quote that uh, I'll just read out the highlighted part. Uh, the products of laziness and intense struggles may look the same and consist of references, data, lists, diagrams, and hypotheses. And to label these as not theory makes sense if the problem is laziness and incompetence, but ruling uh, out the same five may flow inquiry if the problem is theoretical development still in its early stages. So I, I just literally read out the quote from the paper. So that's the point. Like uh, I later sort of realized that even though I thought of myself as lazy, I'm not actually lazy. And uh, funnily enough, the first boss who really kind of like gave me executive uh, cover, um, uh, Steve Hoover at Xerox, I remember when I started at Xerox and he kind of like picked me up to... Uh, basically a champion my project, uh, I, I kind of like made this self-deprecating remark then that uh, I'm kind of lazy and he kind of like corrected me and said, you're not uh, lazy. Most people are intellectually lazy and you're not intellectually lazy. And I was like, yeah, that's actually valid. Like even though I'm not willing to put a lot of work into polishing stuff, I'm actually completely willing to do hard thinking because I enjoy it. Like if you give me a hard problem to think around, to think about, I will actually sit down for six hours and literally just think about it. And what comes out, maybe this, uh, what uh, Carl White describes, like, you know, messy set of anecdotes, mind maps, a couple of like memes. And it might look like it's just shit posting and indistinguishable from the products of laziness, like uh, Carl White says. Um, but it's different because uh, those who know, know. Like, if you look at the output and talk about it with the person who generated it, very quickly becomes clear who has depth of thought behind what looks like a shit post. And who has it just as a shitpost and they have nothing more to say about it than the one meme they came up with. So there's like, uh, think of it as shitposting with depth, where it's like you throw out a shitpost that might be a tweet uh, length thing, but you can talk about it for hours. If you can't talk about it for hours, it really is just a shallow shitpost. Yeah, I think think Trunk Fan does this really well um, on Twitter. Like he, he... he shit posts about business stuff, but there's always like, oh, he's understanding the the lower level context here. And then we'll then you often like find these people and they're like have these long form essays and you're like, oh wow, a lot of depth here. <laughs> um, but it's it sounds like the basic trade off you're making is instead of spending ten hours on slides, you might um, spend ten hours just reading other books, which I think if you've come from a traditional workplace for a long time feels wrong and feels like you shouldn't be doing that. Um, because if I used to read books at my desk and people would be like, why are you not working? <laughs> <laughs> um, because that's the default mindset. So did you consciously make that or you just kind of let your natural impulses take you there? Uh, I would broaden what you said to uh, like, um, you use the time. Like if you're saying 10 hours, um, which you might do on slides and spreadsheets, you use the 10 hours in a much more tasteful way. In some cases, that might end up being like reading a book for nine of those hours and then one hour you just like have 
scribbled notes. Mm -hmm. In other cases, it might be like, you know, um, reviewing a dozen articles. It might be like no reading at all. You might use all 10 hours for just sitting with a notebook in front of you or a whiteboard and thinking through ideas. But the point is uh, taste. And by taste, I mean something like when you look at a problem or a situation, there's an obvious scope and a lot of stuff within that scope. And if you have no taste, you kind of distribute your attention relatively randomly, often based on like uh, uh, very lazy habits of thought and execution. So if you look at any random problem and your response is, I should do 30% discovery, 40% spreadsheet, 30% uh, PowerPoint, that's not being tasteful. But if you're doing that because that's your muscle memory and that's how you've handled every other project in the past, you will not ever do like interesting strategic work. Whereas if you look at uh, a problem and say, hey, this calls for a very different approach and maybe uh, really this is such an ambiguous and weird problem that what I should do is pick up a poetry book uh, from the 17th century and read a few poems and then um, go maybe try to write a poem and do a little painting to understand my uh, mental model of this uh, situation. That can often be a huge and much a bigger breakthrough. Uh, so I think taste is two things. One is simply courage. Courage to like uh, think about things in sort of the priority suggested by your intuitive response to the reality. That then you're looking at this confusing chaos of inputs you're supposed to like do something with, and your intuition tells you this is more important than that. That's less important. That can be ignored. And it, of course, you, you kind of need some experience to trust your intuition, but once you have that experience, actually trusting your intuitions and running with them as opposed to like second-guessing yourself and saying, hey, I, my intuition tells me that this one paper is far more important than the other 99 papers I've collected, and I should spend all my time understanding this one paper in depth. Trusting that intuition and being bold enough to actually do that as opposed to saying, no, my boss will be bad if I don't write two sentence summaries of all hundred papers, including the 80 bullshit ones, that's not having the boldness. And the taste comes in with, you could be wrong about picking the one paper that matters. So you better like be right a lot, which, which is an Amazon leadership principle. So it's like experience, taste, boldness allows you to like almost give yourself permission to be creative in how you approach a problem. And uh, I think a lot of people get almost all the way to the end where they have the experience, they have the taste, they have the judgment, they have the intuitive sense of what's right and wrong, but they fail to make that last leap of like giving themselves permission to actually act on that and say, hey, the right answer here is not, uh, you know, 30, 30, 30, uh, discovery, PowerPoint, um, whatever, but the right answer is, you know, 90% poetry, 10% paintings. And I think people underestimate how valuable this is to executives. Executives are sort of in like a fog of war of their own company at all times um, and don't have a lot of opportunities to like get that context and step back. It seems like what you're sort of doing with the the sparring sort of approach to consulting you're doing is helping people like take that step back with you and sort of see the broader landscape, see how their decisions fit in and like actually pressure test them. Whereas like inside the company, I think a lot of people don't understand this either that like executives rarely get like pushback or like a lot of challenge. A lot of people are just saying things to further their careers or just go along with things. So it can be pretty valuable. Um, did you sort of understand this from the beginning or did you know this um, through trial and error essentially? I think I sort of like unlocked this ability in myself the first time I quit my initial PhD advisor where it was like, I really have to push back in this direction he's pushing me in. If I don't, I will be miserable for years and maybe and maybe not get a degree I hate. So I had to push back as a sort of existential crisis. But it's like, it's not so much a skill. Again, I, I, I keep going back to boldness. Like once you unlock that, like, I don't know, streak of courage in yourself to simply like push back, it becomes like something you use in all situations and pretty soon you cannot operate in any other way. Uh, but I think you hit on the right concept there in the um, uh, minute ago when you said executives are in their own fog of war. Uh, and this is uh, critical because their fog of war 
consists of the standard operating models that they're forced to operate in 90% of the time for routine stuff, right? Their reports come up with them with like routine presentations on how routine things are going. And that's important. You kind of need that bread and butter bulk of what they're monitoring, inspecting, um, sort of making decisions on. Uh, but it also, it's it's the fog of war in the sense of it's their own mental models trapping them. And it's what competitors and adversaries will ex exploit, right? If you're like constantly caught in like, 100-hour weeks, wall-to-wall -wall meetings with never breathing room to even think creatively about what you're doing, then your competitor can say, hey, I'm watching this guy with complete tunnel vision barrel down this path with like enormous energy and they're not even paying attention to what's like slightly in peripheral vision and I can like just take them out with this disruptive move that looks so easy and it often works, right? And I think the job of uh, people like us, whether or not people use my particular playbook of, uh, you know, sparring conversations, it's part of your job to get inside your client's head and help them break out of their FUD. And this is why I think of sparring as um, partly uh, uh, an adversarial pattern, as in you're using the same get inside the OODA loop of the adversary mentality as in these are their mental morals. This is the tempo of how they're making decisions. And I can actually sneak in and hack it and like uh, take over and hijack it and make it do other things. And if I were a hostile, if I were a competitor, if I was like working for somebody else, wanting to derail them uh, and to develop the skill, you can actually do the, like, use the same skill to undermine what they're doing. Like the, it's sort of a double-edged sword. Like once you learn how to like penetrate the fog of war and actually start like uh, influencing how a person is thinking, you can always use it in two ways. One is to undermine what they're doing, subvert them, cause them to like self-destruct in like more painful ways. Or you can get inside their head to actually make them better, like uh, reinforce the things they're doing well, uh, plug some of their blind spots with like some awareness. And most of us are used to doing both. Like, you know, a, a baby, if you're taking care of a baby, uh, which uh, you'll soon be doing uh, here, uh, you'll... You got, a baby is a helpless uh, being that completely relies on you and cannot speak initially. And you kind of have to like get inside its head to like understand its needs and like get ahead of them and like create a nurturing environment, right? And then in an adult world, I use this example in my uh, older book, Tempo, uh, uh, an attentive waiter at a um, fine dining restaurant has to be the same way. Like if you keep interrupting the diners to refill their water glasses too often, you're just going to annoy them. But if you don't show up when they're expect to be served, you're going to annoy them in a different way. So you kind of have to be inside their head and just like slightly, subtly acting to make their dining experience much better. And um, I, I like this sort of uh, service conceptualization of uh, supporting senior executives because this is, um, people may not like the notion of being in service um, and sort of the servant leader mindset here, but yes, you are being paid, you are serving another person and helping them do better. And you kind of have to have this mentality that's somewhere between uh, nurturing a child that may not always know what it wants, uh, being a waiter that is serving a diner, and in some cases, somebody who's like in many ways far more talented and uh, smarter than you and knowledgeable than you in like 99% of ways, but you can be the person who helps them sort of be much better where you can kind of get past their foot uh, shield. So yeah, it's, it's a skill and it's part of your job description to actually operate this way. You talked about the the two sides of exploring system, systematic doubt and systematic confidence. Um, Go ahead. Do you think this sort of maps to like temperament too? Um, I found when reading this, I tend to explore the systematic confidence side more and I wonder if this is like my natural like optimism. Um, I think it it probably depends on the industry too. Like a, a niche I've sort of fallen into is advising small and medium sized advisory firms, and basically helping them under. I guess I'm exploring systematic doubt as well because I'm helping them explore their blind spots um, as well as like helping them build confidence on what they don't know. Um, how do you think about these two poles? Uh, I, I think there's a two by Two, this was part of, I forget now what the other axis of the two by two was. But yeah, the systematic doubt versus systematic confidence, it's of course a function of both uh, your own temperament and the client's temperament. 
Uh, but to the extent you're able to sort of do it, the trick is to suspend your own preferences and give the client what uh, the situation demands they need, right? Uh, some clients, even if you prefer to give systematic confidence, some clients are actually in desperate need of systematic doubt and vice versa. And sometimes what they want, what they say they want, what they think they want are not all the same thing. So for example, uh, I don't really like working with uh, early stage startup and uh, very small companies too often because often they have extremely fragile psyches and they have to do a lot of uh, uh, self-talk, positive motivational self-talk, hustle porn, like keep derping the, uh, like, you know, um, ignore the haters kind of memes on Twitter. And it's like, yeah, maybe you need to do that to manage your psyche, but if so, it's not an interesting sort of problem I want to help you with. I want to help people who are like um, already strong enough to be past that. And I want to help you actually think about the world rather than your own psyche. So I think my personal bias is away from like boosting systematic confidence, partly because um, those roles tend to more easily blur with and slip into therapy. And I don't like doing therapy. Uh, and I'm, this is part of the reason why I very carefully distinguish what I do as not executive coaching, but executive sparring, because executive coaching often is code for uh, therapy, but I'm not willing to call it that and get an actual therapist. So, uh, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, so, yeah this, it's temperament, but yeah. That's a good distinction. I, I think as we were talking about, I think I'm probably in the same um, side of it, exploring the systematic doubt. I I'm much, I'm not wired to deal with the early stage startup um, mindset. Either. And it's not just early um, stage. Like uh, big company CEOs often have the same kind of like yeah. security and need for validation. So it occurs all over, but it's more likely in uh, younger, smaller companies that have not yet proven themselves in the market because then all your insecurities about the business turn into like uh, self-doubt. So your problems in the marketplace and the org turn into problems in your head. Uh, whereas a, pr a company that has found product market fit, and that tends to be where I can, can be helpful, um, they have a, uh, the company has established a certain level of confidence in itself. So it doesn't all have to be like uh, you projecting your own mental problems onto the company's uh, fortunes. A great uh, perspective I thought you had in I, this was one of my favorite uh, posts you had when you're writing the newsletter is this idea of the clutch class. Um, a very bizarre thing for me when I shifted from employee to independent contractor, it was like seeing how policymakers talk about um, self-employed people. And basically the, like they are full-time employees. So they're coming up with these policies and they think like independent people, portable benefits and we'll just solve this. This will be great. Um, we'll give them employ. It's like we're you're not even like in the same territory uh, <laughs> as like how people are thinking about it. So like I love this idea of the clutch class. It's not capital uh, class. It's not labor class. It's certainly not the professional managerial class. Like what is the clutch class and why does it matter? So I think I've had a couple of chapters on this and uh, I'm pretty blunt about this. The clutch class is the scabs. Like literally people who apply old school uh, collective action and labor solidarity kind of thing and think in terms of like uh, unions for gig workers, especially uh, above what I call the platform layer. Like maybe unions make sense for Uber drivers and uh, people delivering for Amazon. Uh, I don't know. I'm not in that class, but anybody who's offering a slightly differentiated information-based uh, consulting or contracting product, there's almost no chance that uh, solidarity and collective uh, sentiment-based um, class consciousness is going to be useful for you. Now, you might still have like uh, a political uh, sort of set of beliefs that uh, make it worth your while to invest a lot of your surplus, um, uh, your time, attention, financial capital in supporting the labor class, that's fine. Uh, but don't lie to yourself that you're somehow naturally uh, fit into the, I don't know, 1920s style labor union uh, mode. You don't. Uh, which means, uh, like, um, this is why I think one of my more unpopular threads of thought in the newsletter and the books, which is 
I think the free agent unions are bullshit. I think you should basically be out for yourself. If there's like um, situations where you think there's like the ethics of employment involved, you kind of have to think through those ethics problems yourself. Sometimes it might make sense to like um, side with others and not work with uh, companies that uh, have really bad practices. But fundamentally, you kind of have to own your moral agency in the work um, in the world of work. And this is a clutch class. Uh, and uh, yeah, for those who are not familiar with the word, word it's, uh, it's it's kind of an Americanism. I don't think uh, outside of America it's used. But the clutch class is in the sense of like uh, people who deliver in the clutch in the sort of the sports world. You know, it's down to the last point. I know you follow basketball and if you can actually deliver and score that final point, you're like a good clutch player. That's one connotation I wanted. And the other connotation I wanted was uh, a clutch in the sense of an um, automotive drivetrain, as in between the engine and the wheels, you've got this whole transmission chain and the clutch actually engages or disengages. And you need that when you're shifting gears or like um, changing gradients or things like that. So we are the class that help uh, businesses like change gears and so forth. Yeah, it's a weird sort of perspective because, I mean, I know what I'm getting into. Um, And you sort of decide that you're okay with being this sort of like invisible layer in the world, right? I think you you write in the book, you say, we're members of the clutch class who largely own our means of production, have too high a degree of agency in shaping our own lives to be part of labor and too little wealth to be part of capital. Um, and I think this is something I think a lot of people underestimate. People are like, I mean, I've explored the healthcare, um, but at the end of the day, I don't waste too much time thinking about it or complaining about it. I mostly just explore it to like try and highlight these things, but I don't really expect to be saved. Like I, <laughs> I know the downsides of what I'm opting into. Um, maybe over the long term, I think you wrote this like speculative fiction. Um, looking back like a few hundred years ago and sort of poking fun at like our current healthcare will probably be seen as like a human rights violation. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're you're sort of like you're giving up your identity, your status, your like <laughs> the opportunity of being this like sort of middle upper class uh, professional life, um, and you have to find the the reasons why it's worth it. Like I, I don't think you can come into this world expecting you're going to get all the things you had in a paycheck type life. Yeah, and uh, I do want to say though that um, for one, um, the ACA actually did make a big difference in my life. I, oh I came yeah, runner right after Xerox, and then we were on my wife's school graph after she quit. Uh, so ACA made a big difference in my life, um, but I, it would not have changed my decision either way. I would have found some like messy private insurance or something else. Yeah. Uh, and, and in other parts of the world, it's not even an issue. But I do want to acknowledge that, yeah, it, it's a certain amount of privilege to be able to think like this. Like, uh, ACA is not cheap. I pay over a thousand dollars here in California for myself and my wife. And there it used to be a couple of hundred dollars co pay when I was a paycheck employee. And for a lot of people, especially those with like, you know, chronic conditions, at least in the US, healthcare alone is a deal breaker. Like, if you're in Europe, maybe, but in the US, and you just might not have the kinds of skills where paying thousand dollars a month for insurance is an option. But yes, I think your broader point is right that um, fundamentally we're talking about a class of people whose agency is high enough that if this is what's stopping you, your mental models and attitudes are probably more at fault. And I think the best example of this is the adjunct class in universities. So all these people with like PhDs in obscure subjects who are like basically exploited by universities. Now, I think NYU is facing like a big strike with its adjunct staff. They're paid like ridiculously low amounts for um, New York and something similar is happening in um, uh, the University of California system right now. And my reaction is, yes, this is an obviously exploitative system. You're like screwing yourself badly with your, you know, advanced information uh, knowledge. And yes, it might be a slightly self-indulgent degree you found for yourself. But your options are certainly better than teaching English literature at really low pay as an adjunct somewhere versus uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's. That's not the only two options. There's a whole bunch of like creative options in between where you don't have to be underpaid. You can afford health, health insurance and you can have a better life. So it's almost like a sense of learned helplessness for a lot of people. 
to slot themselves into the unionized labor class when they really are not. So it's a, it's a mental trap. Yeah, it, it, I've seen this as a feature on this kind of path because at any minute I spend whining or complaining about my situation is like minutes I can actually make my life better. Um, so th- I went from like complaining about like situations at a big company to zero minutes a year <laughs> focusing on like whining or complaining about my um, conditions, which is it's a pretty powerful shift for a certain like temperament that likes that uncertainty, but um, was a huge upside. I realized you, you also said about the clutch class um, paraphrasing Chris Dixon, what the clutch class does on evenings and weekends, everyone will be doing in 10 years. What does that mean? So uh, I think this actually relates to your comment just now that you spend zero uh, percent of your time thinking about like um, all the corporate bullshit that uh, employees tend to spend, I don't know, a third of their time whining the bump. <laughs> uh, the flip side of that is we do have to spend a third of our time tracking upcoming changes in like just the infrastructure of how we live, right? Um, like um, Substack is coming up, Teachable came up a while, uh, the Substack is already out there and Teachable came up a little before. Kind of have to watch like what are the options for money making coming along? What are the options for money making that I thought were secure that are vanishing under my feet, right? So it's like you're living in this world of creative destruction. So, uh, for example, the whole drama at Twitter that's going on right now as we speak, for a lot of people who are yeah. experienced in free agency and the creative economy who may have put all their distribution eggs in the Twitter basket, this is a moment of like panic and crisis. And for me, while it's interesting to track as somebody who's on the scene and a very online user of Twitter, it's fundamentally kind of irrelevant to me what happens to Twitter because I've because of precisely this because of my evenings and weekends habits of like uh, uh, kind of living partly in the future. I mostly rely on an infrastructure that's like thirty percent past, thirty percent present, forty percent future. So I have like enough things going on that any one of them like failing on me, I don't have to whine or moan about it. I can just let it go and make something else up. So. Yeah, if Twitter goes down, I will lose a big distribution channel and I'll have promotional problems. But I have three other live things and then, you know, Web3 is coming up. I'm experimenting with NFTs. None of those really are like viable options at the moment. They're like fun play money. But yeah, I I have those options and that's what my evenings and weekends comments is about. Like, you have to be doing this. You have to be exploring the emerging landscape and like tracking which parts of your current landscape are fragile and possibly crumbling and like, constantly keep, uh, I don't know, dancing on this shifting landscape. Yeah, does this relate to your idea of keeping a 10-foot pole uh, between your public identity and your freelance um, or gig identity? Hmm, I'd like to think about that. I'm not sure it does. I think it's partly just... uh, uh, sort of a pragmatic decision as uh, as in a lot of the details of um, like how people like us make money is actually extraordinarily boring to talk about. Yes, I could like talk for an hour about uh, how I respond. It's very true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have my habits for how to respond to clients, how to write emails. If ever somebody asks me to write a document, how to negotiate that, how to talk about like, you know, hourly versus uh, project-based billing. And I touch on some of that in the books uh but even in the books it's like yeah this boring stuff if you're not smart enough to just think it through and figure it out all this other stuff is not going to help you so partly the distance between my social media and sort of public persona and sort of the day-to-day of my working life as a money-making um independent consultant it's just leave out the stuff that's both boring and unimportant uh, because it's not fun to talk about and if you're smart enough and to figure that out you'll get to the rest, but if you're not smart enough to figure that out, you're going to get killed on other fronts anyway. So there's still not much point talking about it. So yeah, I guess it's a little bit of a, to the extent I'm here doling out advice in these books, a little bit of a top love uh, poster. I'm not giving out any of the basic advice because if you can't figure that out, you have bigger trouble ahead of you. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Tom Critchlow wanted me to ask uh, what, 
Um, can you tell us about some of these projects you're working on? Like, wh- what are you working on? H- how are you working with some of these clients? Um, if you can talk about them, um, well, yeah, because people would my, be curious just to hear a little more. Uh, most of my work is NDA, so I can't talk about most of them. Uh, but I can sort of like um, talk, uh, maybe mention a few. So, um, one client I worked with for over a decade is Jim Keller. He's uh, kind of a legendary figure in the semiconductor world. And he was one of my earliest clients. Uh, he had just left Apple where he had been building the key Apple mobile chips. And he joined AMD, you know, leading their um, engineering org. So, he brought me on to like help him like um, in his role there. And then I followed him from... Uh, uh, AMD to a few years at Tesla, where he was building like the early generations of compute at Tesla. Then he moved on to Intel for a few years. Yeah, and then now he's at a company called Tenstar, and he's uh, uh, CEO of Tenstar, and it builds AI hardware as well as uh, Risk Five chips. So uh, through working with Jim across four or five com- four companies, uh, I've basically become sort of like a soft. Um, specialist in the semiconductor industry and it's one of my favorite lines of work and again i don't talk about this much on twitter because the percentage of people on twitter or anywhere else who can kind of like keep up with the high-end conversations of the semiconductor industry is like vanishingly small so i have more fun just talking about it with people who know semiconductors uh and this is kind of generally true like besides ndas another reason i don't i keep this arm's length distance between social media and my work is Honestly, there's a there's sort of like a competence bar to talk about any industry at a depth where you're doing like at least technologically informed consulting. If you're consulting on like purely managerial side things like, you know, org structure or marketing or sales, maybe there's a lot to talk about in public. But most of what I do is supporting technology leaders. So there's not as much to talk about. So yeah, semiconductors is one. I just wrapped up like a five-year yeah, gig with Amazon. I was uh, supporting uh, uh, Dara O'Rourke, who, who, who was leading their sustainability work. He's back at Berkeley now. He's a professor there. So that was really rewarding. I, it helped me pivot from 90% tech industry work to much more uh, work in like sustainability uh, stuff. So I learned a lot about like, um, you know, net zero, sustainable uh, manufacturing and supply chain, all those things. It was my big, huge learning project for five years uh, with Amazon. Uh, and in the same department, uh, I also learned a lot about this at Tesla, which in some ways is a climate company. And another client I think I can mention is uh, Origin Materials. It's a Sacramento-based company that turns like uh, uh, ag waste and agricultural products into negative carbon plastics. And this was another amazing uh, game. It's all, all these, um, this one's ongoing as well. Like I keep working with them occasionally. But uh, what I like about all my favorite gigs is, I since I, I'm an engineer myself and tend to be hired by people who come up through the technology side of businesses. One of the things I have that that I sh- can share with all my clients is sort of like a shared uh, ability to be nerd sliced by interesting uh, technology things, like whether or not it's in my wheelhouse. Like I'm an aerospace engineer with a special uh, specialization in control theory and things like you know chemi- chemical engineering, manufacturing are part of my wheelhouse. But I'm still enough of an engineer that I can go much deeper than most like generalist consultants. And it's really fun to like be nerd typed and go deep into these subjects with people who really know their stuff in the industry. Like uh, a four hour conversation with the CEO of like a deep organic chemistry company is like a rare experience in modernity. Very few people have that kind of opportunity. So yeah, that's the kind of dig I have and really enjoy where I can learn a lot about uh, you know, nerd slide sectors in technology. Yeah, and I think that's one of the best um, upsides to working in this field is you can sort of design and reach out to gigs that might be 80% beyond what you know, but um, you can learn more than you your client learns um, in a yeah. way. Um, what does the future of indie consulting look like? I was um, part of an in- initial experiment as part of like Yak Collective, and I found that really rewarding. Um, although I kind of like flowed out of that, but um, 
it was really fascinating how we had a bunch of different people come around to kind of collaborate on this report. And I was lucky enough to like help project manage some of the like presentation we were pulling together. And it was one of the first times I had experienced that team environment again that I definitely miss, um, but it's not worth working full time for. Um, what what have you learned from Yak Collective and um, where do you think things are headed in terms of that? Yeah, the Yak Collective has been uh, fascinating. Like, uh, I think I have several chapters in the books about the future of consulting coming at it from different angles. And I think the Yak Collective fits into a <laughs> broader trend, uh, which I called, I think, uh, fourth generation consulting, or was it fifth? I don't know. I think fourth. Uh, but fourth, the idea that fourth wave, old, I think. Yeah, yeah fourth wave. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's about moving on from this uh, first era of like largely individual solo people to more like uh, uh, squad-like approaches to consulting where you team up with several people. And uh, there's a nice article called Squad Wealth by Toby Shore and a bunch of others at the other internet uh, that gets at this. Uh, so yeah, the Yak Collective has been like really fascinating. Uh, we've only done one big project. Um, I don't think uh, you were part of that. Were you near Futurama? No, but okay. no. We did a bunch of like just spec projects which we put out there. Uh, we did one paid project, uh, as happens with a client of mine, um, Brian Johnson, uh, who founded Kernel. It's a New York tech company. So we did a project for them. We're talking about another project with a um, client uh, of one of our other members uh, right now. Uh, but I think um, for... Um, so I think the soft social side of how to coordinate groups of people to do interesting projects, the Yak Collective and other places, we're learning a lot very rapidly. We know how to do them better now. We know how to like coordinate better. You really got us off to a really good start. Like I wasn't even expecting the Yak Collective to go down that route. But when you came up with that idea of like just pulling together the deck um, rapidly, that was um, kind of like what got us down this path. And I think we figured out a lot of the procedural pieces, soft management pieces and other pieces. But uh, honestly, the biggest sticking point now is um, uh, the hard financial logistics plumbing. Like, Literally, who's going to be the counterparty of the client and take on the risks? How, who's going to like recognize the revenue on their books and then uh, subcontract out the money? Like I did that with the one paid project I had, and it was annoying because I, I was doing things like, all right, six hundred dollars is the level at which you have to issue a ten ninety nine to a subcontractor. <laughs> so I literally ended up structuring the project so that very few individual pieces uh, went above the six hundred dollar uh, line. So only three of us uh, uh, did enough on that project to be paid more than six hundred. So it's kind of stupid that these kinds of like um, logistical constraints uh, limit uh, how well you can do this kind of like uh, future of consulting uh, type work. Uh, but I think um, there's a promising science there. Like, you know, if you use Web3 tools like uh, Multisig Safe and you're paying each other in cryptocurrency, uh, if you're working with a crypto client who is willing to pay in crypto, <clears throat> this is not a problem at all. You just put in like a split contract or a Multisig Safe and no, no single person has to be uh, a counterparty. A literal hive mind can come together in a split contract. The client can pay and the money just flows automatically. And I think this is a beautiful thing. And hopefully in the future, this will get a lot better. A lot more clients will be able to like operate in this mode. So we have a lot of these um, infrastructure things to figure out. And of course, yeah, there's a maturation, capability maturity model here. Like I think we're all at the lowest level of the pyramid and knowing how to make this work but it's only going to get better. So I think that's a really important thread in the future of consulting. And there's other things. I think like another big one is maintaining a portfolio of things that look like consulting gigs, things that look like events, things that look like publishing. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff brewing. You said that you think uh, the gig economy will outgrow the paycheck economy. Um, is that s We're two decades into the gig economy um, what do you what do you mean by that? Is it a numbers thing, or is it that people will just be working a job and other things on the side? What does it look like? It is a numbers thing, and it is a portfolio thing. And the numbers thing um, is one of my favorite statistical factoids. I don't think I actually mentioned this anywhere in the book. It's an older article of mine, actually in my review of uh, Dan Pink's Free Agent Nation, which is on uh, Ribbon Farm. Um, but I found this factoid, I think, in... Um, Garrick Morgan's uh, images of organization that sometime in the 1780s, uh, about 80% of the U.S. was not paycheck employed. So only about 20% was paycheck employed. 
everybody else was basically in what was then the gig economy. So like informal farm labor, town labor, artisans, all that kind of stuff that we would today call the gig economy. Then over nearly 200 years of like um, industrial organization, the peak was around 1980 when something like 85 to 90 percent of the workforce was organized in a standardized paycheck world. And then Dan Pink uh, has a couple of data points, so I put those two together. But the trend line, I would say, is that if you count correctly, I would say something like 40% of today's workforce is probably in the gig economy, though it doesn't look like that in BLF uh, statistics in the U.S. because they count wrong. Uh, because you should ca count things like, you know, Manpower Inc. is the biggest employer in the U.S., but it's fundamentally like a contract placement house. If you're working for Manpower Inc., you're not a paycheck employee. You're a gig employee in a particularly weak situation, but you're a gig um, worker. But so, yeah, it's a, it's a numbers thing. And I think the trend, the reason I believe it will continue this way is partly just the shape of the graph. It went steadily from like 20% employment to 80% employment between 1780 to 1980 to two centuries. And then there's enough data points since then to show that it's coming down. So of course, you're like factoring things like uh, workforce participation rate, which uh, which is interesting, by the way, that after the uh, recession, that actually plummeted from, I think, about 67, 68% to about... 62%. So a lot of these people being counted in the official employment stats, uh, they're like uh, tagged as um, out of the workforce or not looking or something like that and simply like eliminated. And that's not true. These people are like doing Etsy businesses. They're taking little gigs. They're not, they're simply not showing up on the radar at all. So uh, yeah, I think this is a huge trend. And I, I, I liken it to how industrial uh, labor organization replaced agricultural labor organization. Like at one point, more than 80% of the world's uh, workforce was um, ag. Now it's less than 5%. Transportation was huge at one point, and it's now again, last I checked, it was like less than 15%, maybe 20 to 15%. Uh, like at one point, I, I would assume like double digit percentages of people were involved in like just moving stuff around. Now, 6% of the workforce is truck drivers. And that looks like a lot, but 6% is about the same as like structural frictional unemployment of like just work uh, labor force churn every month. So, uh, and truck drivers move like massive numbers of tons of goods, very large distances. And this would have employed hundreds of like horse drawn cart drivers uh, a few centuries ago, right? Uh, so, I think an equally massive displacement is happening. But just as the ad economy went from like 85 plus percent to like 5 percent, the industrially organized workforce in paycheck form is going to shrink down to like, you know, low teens, maybe. Like, yes, there'll of course still be people with like standard paycheck jobs and that kind of structure around their work. But it's not going to be 80 percent. It's going to be more like, I don't know, 20 percent. And the rest, it, be, it doesn't need to be that way. So it won't be. It'll be much more fluid. Something I read about is how this like default script has such a hold on our our minds, and you sort of gave me the language that I was like deep programming a success cult, which I really liked. Um, but I, I do wonder if like we're going to be in a free agent world, and we're going to have these like last survivors of the, the World War II, like in the jungle, like we must still have full time jobs. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I think I think I imagine we're still like ten years away from like a true like shift in consciousness and how we're thinking about work. But um, it's fun to watch it uh, shift and change, and have learned a ton from your writing. Thank you. As a live from uh, yours, I really loved your book. Um, yeah, the pathless path is kind of a wonderful phrase for getting off this sort of like uh, set of like scripts that trap you and having to make up your own script on like a pathless landscape. Awesome. Where can people uh, find your stuff, um, follow you? Uh, where should people follow you if uh, you're no longer in Twitter and people are listening to this <laughs> in a year? Uh, so yeah, I'll... Back, back wait, to gonna, Quora? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not back to Quora. That kind of went downhill. <laughs> uh, Twitter, I'll probably be there for as long as it is still fun. So VGR on Twitter... I'm also VGR on this new thing called Forecaster. It's kind of a Twitter-like thing that's uh, built on like a decentralized blockchain infrastructure. Uh, I'm probably not going to experiment with Mastodon um, uh, again. I, I did that before, but VGR on Forecaster. 
but my main blog is uh, ribbonfarm.com and I also have a substack called uh, studio.ribbonfarm.com. So both places um, are great for finding me. And you can go to uh, venkateshra.com for kind of like a general landing page of all my sh- uh, stuff. Awesome. Thank you. We'll link up to everything and uh, keep going with all your writing. Appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Pleasure to be here. Hey there. Thanks for watching that episode of the Pathless Path podcast in video form on YouTube. If you want to see more episodes, you can find links to further episodes up here, or you can subscribe over here. Thank you for your support, and I wish you luck on your own Pathless Path.